Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, dear audience. Welcome to today's session, today, today's discussion. On behalf of Freie Universität Berlin and on behalf of the two sponsoring programs, FUBEST and FUBIS, I welcome you to a panel discussion, the first in a new series that we are offering called Berlin Talks. We're coming to you from the beautiful chamber, the plenary chamber of the Academic Senate at Freie Universität Berlin. My name is Dirk Verheyen, and I serve as academic director in the FUBEST program. This is a new series we're starting today, Berlin Talks. The idea is every month or every two months to offer a wide audience online a discussion, a panel discussion on a timely topic presenting different perspectives and opinions coming to you from the German capital. As I said, the sponsoring programs are FUBEST and FUBIS. Just a quick word about these two programs. FUBEST offers fall and spring semesters with German language instruction, as well as a broad menu of subject courses, most of them taught in English. We also offer an internship option after the spring semester. FUBIS stands for the Freie Universität Berlin International Summer and Winter University. And it is a program that offers three weeks in January and four and six week terms during the summer, also including German language instruction, subject courses, and the two programs have a broad range of social and excursion and field trip activities for the students who participate. Students come to these programs from all over the world. Before we get to tonight's event, I just want to make a few notes here. First of all, this event, this discussion will be recorded, but the identities of audience members uh, is hidden uh, so that there is no way in which you as an audience member would be seen or known through the recording of this event. Secondly, we invite you to use the chat function to submit questions not just towards the end, but already during our conversation, our discussion, so that we can pick up on these questions as the hour goes on. And thirdly, we invite you to, even if you don't submit a question, to drop a quick line uh, through chat to indicate to us where you're located, because we're curious as to how many people in many different parts of the world might be checking into this event uh, through their computer at this current time. So with that, let me get to today's topic. Several days ago, October 3rd, marked the 30th anniversary of the event known as German unification or reunification, that is the coming back together of the two parts of Germany that have been divided after World War II. It was an event that few people had expected, it began, of course, with the surprising and turbulent fall of the wall in November of 1989. And then within a year, the two German states moved inexorably towards reunification. And so October 3rd, 1990 became one more day in the roller coaster ride, otherwise known as German history. And so what we want to do tonight is to reflect on the events associated with that unification with that coming back together of the two parts of Germany and look back, but also look into the future. What are the implications? How has, have things worked out or perhaps not worked out? What does society look like? What are the contours of German foreign policy? What has happened in the area of film and literature? What's the state of German society? All these aspects we want to at least touch on tonight. We obviously cannot cover them in great depth, that would not be possible within an hour. I'm joined tonight by four colleagues who teach in our programs. Dr. Martin Yanda is historian. Dr. Marita Meyer is Germanistin, so German studies specialist. Dr. Klaus Müller is sociologist. 
And Mr. Rolf Schneller is historian uh, and also a retired German diplomat. I have agreed with our panelists to begin with a very personal question, and I will have each of them give us a sense here. And that is, where were they when these events took place? How did it impact them personally and professionally? And I'll give the floor first to Dr. Martin Jan. Thank you, Dirk. On October 3rd, 1990, I started my career as a teacher and researcher in the field of history and political science at this wonderful Freie Universität Berlin. That was exactly the day when the two German post-war states were unified. I knew at that day very well, a hard time will come. I had visited the communist German dictatorship often. I had a lot of friends over there. So I knew the transformation from dictatorship to democracy, that is a complicated thing. Thank you for this first answer. And we turn to When the wall came down, I was in the midst of my final exam uh, for my MA in, uh, at the University of Heidelberg, so in the deep west. The main impact came in the following year uh, when I worked for the summer university um, in Heidelberg and uh, lots of students from uh, eastern countries, from Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland uh, came to the summer university and I never will forget this spirit of a kind of awakening uh, these students with hunger for new ideas and for new experiences and I was in a way infected by this mood and I decided to go east after I had finished my PhD and so I did and I went for five years to Poland with the German academic exchange service. That was the main impact, I think. Thank you. We turn to Dr. Klaus Piller. Well, in 1989, I had spent already 15 years in Berlin, so I was used more or less to a city divided by a wall. So I did not come exactly as a surprise when I heard on the radio that the Politburo on the East made us some decisions which would have some implications. And I thought first, sitting in my bureau, writing on my dissertation, so what? Well, later I decided a different way. I went with some friends together to Checkpoint Charlie and observed how a long line of cars entered West Berlin from East Germany. And of course, it was a very exciting atmosphere, difficult to define. Thank you. Now, being a German diplomat must have been very interesting in those days. Rolf Schneller, give us a sense. Yes, indeed. Um, I had come back to Bonn, which of course was the capital of West Germany at the time. I had come back from the permanent mission of the Federal Republic of Germany, that is of West Germany, uh, to the United Nations in New York, where we used to sit next to each other, next to the delegation of the GDR, the German Democratic Republic. So uh, we had a direct impression there about the issues about the two German states. I had come back in the summer and on the 9th of November, when the war came down, I uh, came back from work, arrived at home, uh, saw or heard on the radio that there was something unusual going on in Berlin. And uh, I turned on TV and I remember still today something very special that is during the session of the Bundestag, when the uh, members of parliament heard about the events in Berlin, they spontaneously started singing the national anthem. And they didn't sing it Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, but of course the official version, uh, Einigkeit und Recht und Freiheit. And uh, interesting, I talked to my son who was five years old at the time. He still remembers that I woke him up to point out there was something very special going on. Thank you. Thank you for those personal memories, all four of you. We are now going to turn back to Dr. Martin Yanda for the first 
or substantive question, and that is that the events that took place 30 years ago are sometimes described as Deutsche Einheit, German unity, but also the word Wiedervereinigung, reunification is used. Uh, then there are those that focus on international law and talk about the accession of East Germany to West Germany into a united Germany. So the question to Dr. Janda is, how should we see this in historical perspective? What is the German experience with unifications? After all, we had Bismarck in the 19th century. Was this a reunification? Is there discussion among historians as to what this ought to be called? Yes, a very important question. I think the term reunification, though it is often used, is not correct. Um, the Germany that we have today did never ever exist before uh, uh, this time we are in now. The old Germany that existed from since 1871 to 1945, that was divided 1945 at the beginning of the Cold War, after the Shoah, after the Second World War. Um, the last freely elected parliament of the GDR, the parliament was called the Volkskammer. They decided, 1990, they want to join the Federal Republic of Germany. And that is exactly what happened on October 3rd, 1990. They became part of the constitution of the Federal Republic of West Germany. And then this was a united German state. So I think the term reunification is wrong, and in my eyes, it is misleading. Today, often people ask, are we a united German nation? Are we one nation again? I think this is the wrong question. After the two world wars, which Germany had started, after the crimes of national socialism. The most important question are, has Germany really transformed into a democratic republic? Does it really give respect to all the citizenship's rights of all its citizens? Is it still committed to those people that have been victims of the National Socialists, and last but not least, does Germany really follow all the things that are written down in the Charter of the United Nations? We will come back to this question of the German past and how it plays out today. I want to turn to a bit of a sociological perspective with Dr. Klaus Müller. Um, Martin Jana just spoke about the notion of nationhood. Uh, one sometimes hears people saying Germany may be one nation or one country, but it is really two societies. It still has an east-west divide. Uh, many of our viewers may have heard the expressions Ossi and Vesi, which were very prevalent uh, after reunification or after unification, after the events of 1990. Uh, so the question to you, Klaus, as sociologist is, what do we have to look for here? What, what analysis can we make, um, sort of um, an X-ray of the contemporary Germany? Is this really two societies east-west? After all, regionalism is also a north-south issue in Germany. So how do you look at this as a sociologist? Well, I think this is a well-posed question because social processes are working a little different from legal processes and political processes. And it would be re relatively difficult to describe what German unification is in sociological terms, simply because unification is not a sociological concept. Unification more or less um, referred to the transfer of a legal, political, and economic order from the West to the East. So on this level, you can have a unification relatively fast. From a sociological point of view, the complicated processes which are which were set in motion in 1989 um, had to be uh, observed and described on different levels. So, first of all, uh, I think it was a 
process of a breakaway from a Soviet type of society organized on totally different principles to a democratic capitalist capitalist market system. And so we would have to distinguish four levels. Uh, we had a change from a planned economy to a competitive market economy. We had a switch from a ideology of Marxism-Leninism to a pluralistic open culture. We had a switch from a one-party political system to a multi-party system with competing parties. And finally, perhaps most important from a sociological point of view, the breakaway of a social structure where life causes, career patterns were defined from the very beginning, where you practically had no unemployment, and uh, the East Germans then had to adapt to a totally new world. As was to be expected, this created some difficulties, and these difficulties, problems, didn't stop with the first elections. So it's not the case when East Germany became an elective democ democracy, suddenly the social problems uh, disappeared. The problems only started because the time scale of these four levels, the processes which work on these four levels, are very different. So and the slowest uh, process probably has been economic reunification, um, because this meant breakaway of an obsolete, uncompetitive, state-organized economy to uh, an economy where new firms had to be introduced, financed, and where all industries had to be restructured. And here all the problems um, appeared, which um, over the years worked um, to a degree that uh, the East Germans may have a very different perspective on unifications than people from the West. Thank you. The, the societal turbulence that you describe for this period that in, in Germany is often referred to as the Wende, as the, the, the change, um, is also accompanied, to use another German word, with a great deal of Umbruch, a great deal of, of turbulent change and, and things uh, familiar passing by the wayside and new things coming in. Um, Dr. Marita Maya, you take the point of view here of, of culture, of literature, film for tonight. Um, if we just take literature for a moment, was there something called a Wendeliteratur, a literature that reflected some of the things that Klaus Müller has just been talking about from a sociological point of view? Uh, yes, in fact, um, there was a there was a vendor that um, um, there was a so-called Wende roman. Um, it was written um, mostly by a new generation of writers from the east: um, Thomas Brosig, um, Ingo Schulze, later Uwe Telkam, uh, Uwe Telkam uh, or uh, Jana Hensel. Um, and uh, I would say uh, this Wenderoman uh, have been important to explain uh, to the broad uh, public of Germany um, how life was in the GDR, how family uh, structures worked and um, how daily life uh, was and what impact um, the fall of uh, the wall had. Uh, on the people of the East. And I know that there is a complaint um, that uh, there are um, missing, um, there are not, that there are not enough um, people in leading positions in, in some fields uh, in uh, Germany. Um, but I think this is not true for the uh, field of literature. I think that there, uh, especially writers play a a big and important role um, today, writers who come from um, the East. And I think that there, on the whole, was an um, enrichment uh, for the German literature, an enrichment um, concerning um, more diversity in, in style and in topics. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up to that. Is that 
something that was live and dynamic in earlier years, or is that 30 years later still a theme? Is there still 30 years later an active Wende literatur, or, or is this something that has passed by in the course of time? Uh, in fact, there still is a, a Wende literatur, and uh, in fact, uh, it is very relevant right now. Um, for example, uh, there are novels by uh, Lutz Seiler, uh, Crusoe, uh, or Stern 111, um, or um, just recently a new novel by uh, Ingo Schulze. And I think these, um, these novels are even uh, more complex and more authentic than the novels um, ha um, have been that were written right after the fall of the war. And if I may um, look at the example of the film, um, because uh, some of uh, the audience may know uh, the famous films uh, in the in first decade, they were mostly uh, produced uh, funny and entertaining films like Sonnenallee or Goodbye Lenin. And then as a kind of counterpart came this uh, very important film, The Life of, uh, Life of the Others, Das Leben der Anderen. Um, but just recently, um, two years ago in, in 2018, uh, um, a film like Gundermann by Andreas Dresen uh, was uh, shown. And I think if you look at this film, this is a um, is a more complex uh, film. Uh, we have Gundermann. Gundermann is um, was um, um, a singer songwriter in the GDR, so he is a, a real a historic uh, figure, and he worked um, in the um, coal mines of the Lausitz. Uh, he uh, was a convinced um, communist uh, at the same time, a straight and sympathetic person and uh, after the fall of the wall um, he uh, is accused by uh, victims um, because he wrote reports for the Staatssicherheit and, and he feels very ashamed um, um, not only because of this writing but uh, also because he he seems to have a kind of amnesia he has forgotten everything. So this is a film full of empathy, and uh, it is critical at the same time. And and it's, um, I think um, it is a um, um, more interesting and uh, and more complex film than the first films or the films of the first decades we have seen. And so this is this is a recommendation to look this film. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we now want to switch out of the domestic contours of things in more of an international direction. And we're going to turn to Rolf Schnelle. Um, when Germany unified, uh, when the two parts of Germany fused together, so to speak, uh, the international scene witnessed the so-called two plus four negotiations to two German states and the four victors of World War II. Um, and Anyone observing that unfolding might have had the sense, well, here comes the peace settlement that never was in 1945, decades later, uh, through the two plus four agreement, because it's exactly these two German states with these four key countries out of uh, the World War II situation. So is that fair to say that that was a kind of a belated peace settlement, or how should we interpret the importance of this two plus four treaty. Yes, indeed. And uh, you uh, quite rightly use the term kind of, and I think I'll come back to that. Indeed, um, as a historian, I think I should go back a little bit uh, and remind ourselves what the situation was uh, when the negotiations on the settlement uh, started. And so I have to go back a little bit. What had been the basis of the German situation in the world since 1945? And there we had the Potsdam Agreement which is called agreement, but it's not quite correct because it's not a formal international treaty. It was a communique and was the basis 
of the cooperation between the uh, for uh, first the three victorious powers and uh, in that sense uh, the issues could not be were not solved because especially the disagreement among uh, the victorious allied uh, powers in 1948 uh, led to a situation where the allied control council uh, couldn't continue working together so in that sense um, the german question as it was called since then uh, always remained open until 1989, uh, 1990. And uh, what is uh, important here is uh, that the treaty uh, was arrived at in 1990. That was called the Treaty on the Final Settlement uh, with Respect to Germany. So it's not a peace treaty. The, the term itself shows it's a kind of a, a hybrid or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I would maybe use the German word Ersatz Treaty. Uh, this is not quite serious, of course, but it's a kind of a peace treaty. And um, of course, the background to it was that people uh, remembered the previous peace treaty after World War I, the Versailles Treaty, uh, with uh, all its uh, problems and consequences. Uh, we can't go into it here, but uh, basically, uh, one of the essential elements was borders and reparations. And that was, again, an issue here for the negotiations. Uh, now, the question is, why not a peace treaty? There were about more than 50 nations uh, in a state of war with Germany. So you could have seen that would have been rather complicated to bring all these nations together who all had their claims for reparations against uh, the, the Germany uh, that, that happened uh, during the Third Reich. So what is the reason why not a peace treaty? There are two elements. Uh, one, the four powers were in charge. They still saw themselves as being the masters of the fate of Germany. So it was logical to say we, the four powers, will have to decide on how and if we want to give up our uh, um, position as uh, the uh, political um, control of uh, all of Germany. And the other element was the time factor. Uh, as I said, it would have taken a long time to have a real uh, peace conference. And uh, it was already obvious that uh, Gorbachev, who had been uh, very instrumental in uh, bringing about the situation where these discussions and negotiations were at all possible, was under serious pressure back home. Uh, the Soviet Union had serious economic problems. He was under political pressure because of his flexible position towards uh, or his readiness to change the, this, the situation. And um, the concern was, quite rightly, that um, pretty soon there was going to be a party congress where Gorbachev might have been ousted. And this concern proved uh, quite justified a year later, in July 1990, when after uh, the treaty had been uh, negotiated, uh, there was the coup against Gorbachev back home. So uh, the a central figure enabling these negotiations uh, was not going to be there anymore. And uh, I have uh, maybe one point since uh, we talked about where we were, uh, the uh, early sign of fundamental changes. Uh, I uh, was uh, a witness of that. Gorbachev's speech at the United Nations General Assembly in December 1988, where he announced uh, huge uh, unilateral disarmament measures. And when I heard that, I had to pinch myself uh, asking, is this really possible? Is it really true? And it reflects uh, the situation, the, the uh, general mood of people. They could not have imagined this to happen until shortly before it really did happen. 
I think our our viewers are getting the sense that Germany is a country where the past is never past. Uh, it is always still somehow playing a role. Uh, things out of the past continue to impact society today. And I want to turn again to uh, Dr. Martin Yanda um, by bringing up a term that is quintessentially German um, that is hard to translate into English, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with the past. Um, Martin, you already hinted at the importance of this issue also in the United Germany. Um, one often reads that uh, the East German regime did not want to take any responsibility for the Holocaust, uh, blamed it on capitalism and the West. Um, and then the argument might be made, the reunited Germany or the united Germany uh, had to, for the first time together, confront this past. But on top of that came a second Vergangenheitsbewältigung, and that is coming to terms with the communist past, the past of division. Think, uh, for example, the whole question of the Stasi in the East with the, the files that people could access and the trials that took place and so on. So what do you see as the state of Vergangenheitsbewältigung in the one G Germany today? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. It's uh, it's a broad topic, and uh, I would need, let's say, an hour to uh, discuss this. But what we can see very easily is that, shortly said, political culture in the United Federal Republic of Germany is split. It seems as if we have two different political cultures in Germany. I want to make four points. First point, when you look at the outcome of political elections in West Germany and in East Germany, that's very different. You never would have such a high percentage of voters as you have in the East who decide for voting the left-wing party in the, in the West. In the East you have, and you never would have so many voters that decide for the right wing, some even say right radical wing party, Alternative für Deutschland in the, in the West, as you have them in the East. First point, the political structure of both sides of the unified uh, uh, Republic are very different. Point number two, you can see that when you walk on the streets, you should go, if you visit Germany, one day to the city of Dresden, a city of the former East. If you walk there, you will recognize not so many immigrants, not so many people of color, not so many international uh, tourists. Extremely opposite if you go to a city of the former West, Frankfurt. If you go to Frankfurt, you will see a lot of immigrants, you will see a lot of international tourists, and you will see um, a lot of um, uh, uh, people of color. Totally different political cultures in one united society. And point number four, the uh, dealing with the Holocaust is totally different in both parts of Germany in one united republic. If you come to East Germany, you will often have that uh, uh, position, as you told uh, Dirk, people are saying fascism is over. Uh, we have given enough. There is no further support needed for the surviving victims of National Socialism. You will have exactly the opposite in the Western part of Germany, coming out of a long culture of debating Vergangenheitsbewältigung. A majority of the people is sure that Germany has done these crimes, that Germans are responsible for these crimes, and then further support for the surviving victims is needed. So this is four aspects of a, in my eyes, divided political culture in the unified Federal Republic of Germany. And those questions, 
What is more important, debating Nazism or debating the commonest uh, 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 tradition? Uh, what is more important? This is a reflex of this totally different split society, which is united as a federal republic under one constitution, but with totally different cultures. Thank you. You already address again societal dynamics, which will bring us back to Klaus Müller. Um, a country like Germany that has had such a turbulent history uh, is a country where I think the analysis requires a focus on generations and a distinction among the experiences of generations. If we look at the 80 so million Germans today, uh, and we look at patterns of socialization, we could argue that the vast majority of them were socialized in either the West or the East uh, of the country during the Cold War. The number of people, of course, socialized before 1945 is biologically speaking dwindling, but then we have new generations coming now since 1990. Um, Klaus, to what extent is a generational analysis important in understanding contemporary Germany? Um, and the way in which the past influences the present and the way in which people's lives have been shaped by different kinds of Germany? Well, um, surely there are typical differences between uh, East Germany and West Germany, but there are also significant differences inside East Germany and West Germany. So if we um, would reformulate the question, uh, we should ask ourselves, what do we expect from a country which is one society? So uh, are the Bavarians unified with the Berliners? I am quite sure the Bavarians would reject, no. And so uh, why are we confronted with the question uh, that the, uh, if the country, Westerners and Easterners, are unified? So um, this is, uh, says something about uh, expectations. And I think the expectations, uh, um, behind the expectations of uh, political cultures in the West and the East are a little different. So here are differences uh, coming out of a communist system which was centrally guided and organized and put on a centralized uh, ideology. The desire for unification in the East surely is larger than in the West. But we should also realize um, that the unification is not simply a psychological act uh, or result of psychological perceptions, it's also an administrative act. So we have, for example, in the East, we have uh, landers, so which means states, which are simply put together by an administrative act, Sachsen-Anhalt. We have the same in the West, Bavaria and Franconia. So, in a way, uh, the political decisions and administrative structures are here for a unified society. So, I think it's a big exaggeration that we still should decide categorically between the West and the East. There are still clearly some differences in the East. The East uh, is less multicultural, as Martin said, less international, and is more oriented to the state. This is a result of the troubles of transformation. So they expect, expect more state intervention. The West is from the very beginning more decentralized. And let's say after decades of re-education, more liberal than the East, but basically it's one of societies with a few interesting differences. Jumping now back, jumping now back into culture, literature, also, again, this question perhaps of generations there. Uh, there were, of course, people who were active filmmakers, also on the literary scene of an older generation when unification came, younger generations came. Do we see some relevance there in terms of generations uh, when we're looking at literature and film, particularly in the eastern part of the country? What about the younger writers? Uh, do they look at things differently than their elders? Is there something, were there tensions there? Uh, perhaps writers who were prominent uh, before 1990 
who lost some of their audience and now new younger writers came. Can you maybe discuss some of the, the new writers, the younger writers, how they're different from, say, some of the older ones? Uh, this is a difficult question. Um, I think that there are many differences uh, in, in between um, the uh, different generations. So I, I wouldn't speak of one generation coming from the East or one gen, um, maybe younger or older ones. There, there are many differences. Um, um, between um, between people, um, of course, uh, in the beginning, right after the fall of the war, there was this debate uh, on uh, authors like Christa Wolf or um, Heiner Müller, and um, how uh, or to what extent they cooperated with the political system, and there was a, a sharp uh, debate and. They, this generation of, of uh, writers from the East lost partly um, uh, their influence, but um, not totally. Like, like some uh, um, some of uh, uh, the intellectuals in in the West uh, stated um, during the the younger uh, generation. Um, I I think it is. Um, it is even difficult uh, if if we speak of a, of a real young generation. It is even difficult to see differences or big differences between East and West. I mean, many of uh, writers from the East live now in the West, and uh, some of uh, the West live in the East. Um, so, I mean, five million. Uh, I think it was about five million people who left uh, the uh, the East after uh, unification, and uh, four million left the West uh, towards the East. So, so I think you, you we really can't speak of a total split between East and West. And um, what is what is interesting if if we look at uh, there are differences between film and literature. I think um, looking at film, uh, I think, uh, or what I've read, we lost uh, we lost a whole generation of filmmakers from the East um, because film is uh, to produce a film is is uh, um, I mean it depends on money and um, you you have to know a lot about um, funding. Uh, you uh, have to know complex structures. So there were many filmmakers, older filmmakers uh, in the East who were not willing or were not able to integrate uh, into this new capitalistic uh, system of filmmaking. But uh, there's another generation who just finished um, film schools like Andreas Dresen. Um, and came to the market. They, I think, they could use uh, all the chances that were given, and there was curiosity also in the West for what these people have to tell and have to show, um, and uh, they play an important role uh, today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me make the jump to international dimensions of things again. Um, we now have. A united Germany in a transformed Europe with new challenges. Think of migration, environmental issues, terrorism uh, have become important issues in, in recent years and, and decades. Uh, we had a West Germany that had a particular foreign policy profile based on the Cold War and of course East Germany the same in its own way. Now we have a united Germany. What would you consider to be the fundamental principles underpinning this united Germany's foreign policy in the in the contemporary post unification environment that it's in. Yeah. Yes, indeed, um, the return of history is a little bit again for me as a historian, of course, a very relevant uh, aspect of this. And uh, the first thing for Germans always to keep in mind, especially when uh, the United Germany was so much bigger and its influence uh, and uh, weight in Europe was uh, so much bigger, 
uh, the concern and uh, memory of the Nazi Germany uh, around Europe, of course, it was uh, strongest in the Soviet Union, in France, and in uh, Great Britain. Um, and I myself experienced it when I was posted in Oslo in the Norwegian parliament when one left wing uh, parliamentarian said when the Norwegians were discussing whether they wanted to join the European Union, uh, the argument was the Germans will now try to achieve uh, by economic means what they did not succeed uh, by military means. And uh, which shows that it is always close to the surface when you uh, scratch a little bit uh, this uh, concern about uh, a strong Germany is everywhere. And uh, it is interesting that in the discussions about the modalities of Germany uh, developing independence as a sovereign state, a very important element was a discussion between Gorbachev and Bush in uh, the in Washington when Gorbachev uh, when um, Bush asked Gorbachev uh, what would you prefer uh, uh, Germany integrated in NATO or one that is neutral unfettered and of course uh, that was a quite a strong argument for Gorbachev to think hey maybe it's better that uh, Germany is integrated into NATO under control, continued control of the United States. Uh, so that is uh, an important element that Germans always had to keep in mind. And so the principles uh, that uh, you referred to, I think, are really best uh, embodied in uh, Article 25 and 26 of the uh, German constitution, the Grundgesetz, Article 25 about international law is integral part of federal law. The text is, the general rules of public international law shall be an integral part of federal law. They shall take precedence over the laws and shall directly create rights and duties for the inhabitants of the federal territory. And the Article 26, ban on war of aggression. Acts tending to and undertaken with the intent to disturb the peaceful relations between nations, especially to prepare for aggressive war, shall be unconstitutional. They shall be made a punishable offense. And I think those are really the fundamental principles, uh, the leitmotif of our uh, general uh, uh, approach to foreign policy to our international relations. And I can show this, could show this all the way through in, in various contexts. And in a way, um, it is important uh, to know that when people complain about Germany not doing enough for NATO, for instance, not uh, spending enough money on defense uh, expenditure, uh, I told people when I gave a talk to uh, Americans during the Iraq war when, to explain why Germany was not enthusiastic in, uh, in, the, in, in joining the Americans in that war. I said, just imagine uh, reversing roles. If uh, Germany were the country that uh, is actively pushing for uh, going into Iraq and attacking Iraq, and America was hesitant, was against it. What do you think the general reaction of the public, of the media in America would be like? It would be, here you go, the Germans at it again. And so I, I told Americans, uh, we look more at the dangers of action uh, uh, rather than inaction. And I uh, said this basic attitude that comes out again and again, is basically a success of re-education after 1945, when uh, the Germans uh, were uh, sort of reoriented away from its old uh, bad spirits. Just a quick follow-up, um, and also tying again back to your, your personal experience. Uh, the principles that you describe, in many ways, were principles, of course, also guiding West German foreign policy. And they, be, they continued in certain ways in the United Germany. To what extent 
do do you know perhaps to what extent were uh, diplomats from the former East Germany taken into the United German Foreign Service, or was that even possible? We have the the case, of course, also with some of the the soldiers of the uh, the National People's Army. But what about the diplomatic corps? Very interesting question indeed. And I was asked about uh, one colleague from New York with whom I had had uh, sort of quite close contacts uh, when he was considered maybe joining uh, the Foreign Service of Re uh, United Germany. And uh, at the time, this guy had been very relaxed and quite self-critical about the GDR. At the time in New York, I decided he must be a 150% uh, uh, guy that he can afford to be that open. And uh, But the to answer your basic question is, there were hardly just a very few people, not high level uh, officials of the uh, East German Foreign Service. They were excellent experts. They had learned languages and all this. But of course, they had also only been in the Foreign Service because they were ideologically uh, safe and uh, definitely uh, politically correct. And uh, there was no danger that they would have defected at the time. So uh, they, they were not really uh, acceptable to the and uh, Genscher, Foreign Minister Genscher at the time made sure that there were no, and that there's one guy, yeah, one guy I remember he was uh, as an ambassador of the uh, GDR coming to uh, New York and, and Geneva, I was also in Geneva at the time. He was really very strict ideological uh, um, person and he tried to get into the Foreign Service uh, and was not allowed. There's one interesting, very interesting exception to this, that is the last ambassador uh, of the GDR in Paris, who of course joined very late after uh, negotiations in 1990, Steinlein. He became the head of uh, uh, Genscher's, uh, of, of uh, Steinmeier's, of our present president's office, and now is head of the, uh, the uh, president's chancery in the um, um, president's office. So he was the person who uh, transitioned from the old guard that was not allowed in, but the new guard in the transition period. He is a very successful, very interesting, good guy. And uh, as I said, he heads the uh, Bundespräsidialamt. Thank you for that uh, addition of, of personnel issues, because that uh, is, of course, one of those aspects of German unification. I want to turn to Martin Jana again um, and preface my question this way. Uh, opinion polls over the years uh, that compare uh, Germany to other countries show a clearly lower level of national identification or national pride. Uh, in a country like Germany, for historical reasons, of course. Um, what is your sense of the current sense of the nation, of national identity? Um, is there more a primary focus on one's own region, one's own regional Heimat, uh, or on Europe? Uh, to what extent is the idea of, of Germany as a, as a nation state something that really ticks in the population and where there's a certain uh, amount of, of pride. Has that changed uh, compared to, to previous decades? Yeah, thank you again for this uh, very important question. We do not have the time to touch all the aspects of it, uh, but a very important question. In my eyes, what we have in Germany today is, let's say, a debate or maybe better said, a fight on what is exactly our national identity. Um, you see this best when you look at the new citizenship law, which passed the uh, parliament in um, January uh, 2000. This new citizenship law says, every kid that is born on German territory is a German citizen. That is different to the old German citizenship law, which was passed in the year 1913. That old law was saying only those people are German citizens 
that have German parents. That excluded many immigrants, foreigners, refugees, and others from citizenship, good jobs, good education, and so on. Today, that has changed. We have a new citizenship law, but the old sense, tradition, culture, of the old citizenship law and the old idea of what a nation is, is still existing in that uh, society. So there's a lot of people opposing the new law and saying, no, those immigrants are not German citizens. They do not belong to our nation. And part of that debate, or better say fight, is another actor. This is right-wing terrorists. Maybe you heard that since October 3rd, 1990, uh, around about 210 people were killed by right-wing terrorists. The majority of those that were killed were immigrants. So the right-wing terrorists are participating in that debate. What is our nation? And the two opposing ideas of that debate and that fight is, is that nation based on human rights, citizenship for all citizens, or is that based on heritage, tradition, uh, uh, blood, uh, and other things? This is a very heavy fight. And we should not, um, this is often downplayed by uh, a lot of researchers and politicians in the Federal Republic of, of Germany. But this is a really severe question. Are we becoming a really modern nation with a modern citizenship law, or is a big part of the population unhappy with this new law and will, wants to come back to the old traditional nationalist, anti-immigrant, anti-Jews, and other uh, conflicts? That's the question. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, I want to be able to turn now to some of the questions that have been submitted by our audience. And uh, basically, uh, all the panelists will have a chance to respond to these questions. Um, uh, the question that is posed here, what in your opinion is the biggest mistake or opportunity not seized? Uh, and what is the best outcome? What are some of the best things that did come out of the unification process? Um, perhaps I can turn to Klaus Müller first, because you already indicated some of these things uh, in previous answers. What would you consider to be the things that were mistakes or opportunities not seized, or where were the good outcomes in this whole process? Uh, so the biggest mistake surely was not to explain to the East German population that the integration of the East German economy would be a very hard and very long way. So the illusion that the markets would do the job was an illusion and uh, with severe consequences and produced a lot of frustration. Um, you could even say that it was a big mistake that the public sector became uh, a set, to, uh, set the wage level in East Germany, the public sector, and put an incredible pressure on the just reviving uh, private sector. Um, the best outcome uh, I, there are many good outcomes. Well, the best outcome from my personal point of view has been the transfer of the Western university structure to the East. So in a very short time, um, many universities were set off and have an important regional function like Frankfurt Oder, Europe University. And um, scaling more down to my personal field, the East German sociology became very well integrated and is very active in the German um, society of sociology. Would someone else like to respond to this question? Otherwise, we turn to maybe a, a second question here. Um, here's a question asked, is there a memorial to the unification that speaks to people from both former German states? If not, what could it look like and where would it be? Uh, of course, there are plans for such a memorial. Um, maybe, Martin, do you want to talk about memorialization of unification um, and say something about the, the current design? I assume you're familiar with it. So that would be 
created in the center of Berlin, the, the famous Dippe, uh, the, the monument that is planned. Maybe you want to address this question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think there is one very big missed thing. On April 12th, 1990, the Volkskammer, the last freely elected parliament of the GDR, they were giving a um, resolution where all the uh, members of the parliament uh, agreed. This declaration called Gemeinsame Erklärung said, and this was new for GDR, we say, that we are responsible for the crimes that the Nazis have committed. We guarantee, I do not know uh, the text by heart, but we guarantee to Poland that we will never ever want to have parts of their country. We guarantee the Soviet Union uh, that uh, we remember the horrific war that Germany has fought against uh, Soviet Union and so on. So, they were coming to all the very important points of the so-called West German debate on Vergangenheit, and they agreed to all of them, which was new because the GDR as a state never had done this. If you look at German politics today, you never ever will see anyone who mentions that document. This was coming out of this revolt against the dictatorship in the GDR. It was not recognized by West German politics. That is one of the very big mistakes of this process of unification because the members of the Volkskammer in that moment, they started to agree to something that is today called the West German form of discussing the past. In that moment, April 12th, 1990, we were able to see, no, there was the opposition against the communist regime, which had learned from the West German debate and tried to adopt it. This is today our biggest problem, but it has to do with that the Western politics did not uh, go forward to that uh, position and say, okay, Let's do that again, and let's do that uh, in a common way. Thank you, Martin. I want to turn to a question now that was posed that it clearly is in the international realm, so we will toss that to Rolf Schnelle. Um, I'll read the question. Uh, it has become obvious that the Germans are integral to the cohesion of states throughout Europe, and so to the process of European integration. Has Germany become the hegemon of the European Union, even without a dominant militaristic presence? Uh, this kind of connects to things that you addressed earlier. How would you deal with this question? Yes, indeed. Uh, it's, uh, it reflects again uh, the problem we have uh, being economically the uh, biggest nation within the European Union in Europe. And in that respect, even if we try not to be too pushy or dominant, uh, just the facts uh, bring about certain effect. And that's why whenever there is a financial crisis of Greece, for instance, it is the German attitude, the German position that influences the overall position of the EU. And uh, the reaction then will be that uh, our chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, uh, is uh, put into um, cartoons showing the Hitler uh, position or something. So very quickly, all these uh, lingering um, sort of fears about German dominance come out whenever the factual weight of uh, the German economy in Europe has an effect. Uh, which, of course, is cannot be denied. But on the other hand, uh, Mrs. Merkel, I think, is really a very good representative of this Germany in that she is low-key and not uh, a sort of uh, dominant person. And uh, 
as some other presidents of other countries sometimes are. So I think uh, uh, it cannot be avoided that there will be uh, the reaction against uh, the factual uh, strength of the German economy and coming with it the political weight within Europe. Thank you. I want now to come to our final question. Um, and this is a question to which I would like to get a brief reply uh, from each of you. Um, imagine that we come back together in 20 years and we're talking 50 years since 1990. You mentioned from your perspective, one thing that you think we will be discussing differently than today when 50 years have passed. What is the potential for a particular issue to be important then, as opposed to now, or an issue that is now important and that languishes and, and is no longer important then? Uh, Martin, let's begin with you. Yeah, I think at the moment we are at the crossroads in, in many ways. Europe is at the crossroads. Do we come together? as a uh, continent of democratic uh, states uh, or do we fall apart and a uh, very important uh, factor in this uh, at this point is which way the federal republic of germany wants to go we see and we have talked about that uh, that there's a lot of internal conflicts under the umbrella of one constitution we know from the past that anti-liberal political cultures lead to destruction of political democratic institutions. And that is a fight that can be seen in the Federal Republic of, uh, of today. So I think 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, this thing would we see today as a crossroads that will be decided in which way we do not know. Thank you, Martin. Marita, how you, do you see this from a Germanistic point of view, in terms of film or literature? If you have to imagine a crystal ball in, in 20 years, uh, what's your best guess? Um, I think, and um, I read uh, when I listen to um, artists uh, from the East, uh, that there are many stories uh, that have not been told yet. And um, I could imagine that some of these stories um, can be told in in the coming years and, and even in, in 20 years. For example, um, what really happened during a uh, unification process? Uh, where did um, politicians from the East go to? What happened to the people who made the revolution? Um, these are, there are many stories that uh, we don't talk about. And, um, there is still a big novelist or uh, some big filmmakers who can find um, material there, I think, I'm sure. Thank you, Marita. Klaus, look in your crystal ball as a sociologist. You have 20 years to go. <laughs> I think in the future would be a quite boring question because most things have been accomplished. Um, if we talk about uh, the common ideal at the time of unification, I think you're going to have a mouse. What quite right, it was a strong currency. Germany really identify with the economy. And one of the main reasons the East Germans like to join the West was the economy. So the magnet theory of the 1950s somehow worked. So the East Germans got the Deutsche Mark, and now we both have the Euro. Euro. So I think uh, also on the level of uh, uh, symbolic monetary integration um, problems are solved. The rest are smaller differences. Wolf. This this is of course at my age a very ambitious time frame that you are setting here, so let's not get go into that. But um, given the short term memory of people, especially of young people nowadays, P 
people in 20 years will not really remember much of what we're discussing these days. And I, they are not predict what the issues are that will confront us. Uh, if you think how unexpected the uh, corona crisis has hit us and uh, how I had never imagined unification of Germany to be able. I remember in, 19, in the 1960s when I was in France, uh, I was asked about a Frenchman, you know, well, how, how do you think things are going to go? And he, uh, I said, no way that the two Germanys will ever be able to get together. And he answered, uh -uh, uh, the national cohesion will prevail and they will, uh, you will get together. That was in the 1960s. So I would say I would not dare to make any predictions of what the issues are in 20 years time. Thank you, Rolf. So you leave something to develop by surprise. Dear audience, we are coming now to the conclusion of today's discussion. Uh, in many areas, of course, we've only been able to scratch the surface. This is a complex topic. It has many ramifications uh, out of the past, out of the present, into the future. I want to thank the four panelists for sharing their experience and their wisdom, their insights on these various questions. I want to thank our technical support team that has made possible uh, the smooth running of this first production uh, in this new series uh, called Berlin Talks. Uh, and I want to thank you, the audience, for having tuned in. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this discussion, uh, learned perhaps something new, gotten a variety of insights here. Uh, this event, again, was recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel. Um, and I just want to give you a little preview of our next event, which is coming up on November 19th, again at 7 p.m. Berlin time. The topic there will be an analysis of the U.S. elections, um, assuming that at that point uh, most of the votes have been counted. Uh, we shall see how that all turns out. Uh, we will have an interesting panel lined up. We're going to have some representatives of the John F. Kennedy Institute here at Freie Universität, the program of North American studies. We will have a former German ambassador to Washington who will join the panel, and we will have the head of the New York Times office, the bureau chief here in Berlin. So with that, again, I thank you, the audience, for having tuned in, for being part of the start of this new series. Uh, I wish you good health and join us again in one month.